Hello, everybody. So I wanted to now get into um, actual patterns of biological diversity, right? So we've defined what biological diversity is. So now let's spend some time thinking about some patterns that we see in that. Now, uh, one of the most common, probably the uh, what we call an ecological law, or as close to we get, as we get to an ecological law, is the species area, area relationship, okay? What does this mean? It basically means the bigger area that you look at, the more species you find, okay? Um, and one of the, or, so let's just look at, say, here, okay? So we've got a picture, area picture of the football field at Whitewater, right? Now, when we think about that, um, how many species can we find there? So, okay, there's some grass so species over here, you know, on the, all the weeds we find. Let's think of, you know, every, every single species that we can think of. There's some trees around the football field, and then, um, you know, all the insects that are buzzing around. You probably find some squirrels, maybe some uh, raccoons. Um, but, you know, that's, that's maybe it. As you zoom out more, what do you get? You get the um, the the nature preserve area out um, on the north side of the football field. You zoom out more. Well, we um, no longer just have you know the nature preserve area, but there's a bunch more of farm fields and all the things that can live there. We zoom out to maybe the whole county, and we see there's a lot of habitats there. And finally, then, you know, once we get to the huge continental scale, we've got a whole lot of different um, whole biomes that we can look at. So the bigger areas that we get, look at, the more species you will find. Um, and so this has to do with more niches, the more niches you have the more species you'll have. Uh, and th th uh, these data that we're um, looking at here in this, this picture is from um, a paper that we'll read by uh, Val Smith and a bunch of other people. But um, what they were looking at was phytoplankton and how their numbers um, correspond to the numbers of the species that of phytoplankton you find in the surface waters of an area compared to the surface area of that. They, they looked at small, tiny, basically little experimental cup size ecosystems up to, um, you know, big ponds, that big human-made ponds, then a bunch of natural systems. So you see here, here is the, um, all the dark, black squares here are natural systems and what they found you know eventually you get the pacific ocean up here as the largest water body but um what they found is you know this very consistent pattern the bigger the area is the more species you'll find there. there's other reasons though that we can think about this is that uh there might be some demographic reasons where larger areas can support bigger populations and those bigger populations then are less prone to extinction okay so you have fewer things of the, the demographic stochasticity and environmental stochasticity I know that's a hard word to say but they have a smaller impact okay so what does that actually mean so stochasticity means like random events okay and one of the most um, well-studied communities are the number of wolves and moose on uh, Isle Royale. Now, Isle Royale is that island that's up in the middle of uh, Lake Superior. So if you think of Lake Superior as that, you know, wolf looking to the left, the eye of the wolf is actually Isle Royale. Now, this is Isle Royale is a natural, uh, national park. And, you know, there's not that much development. There's like one little hotel and people go there. Not very many people go there. So the thing is, um, there's moose on the island and there is wolves on the island. And what we see is 
Um, they've been tracking the number of moose and the number of wolves on this on the island for um, since since the 1960s. And what happens is we can see that there's these really interesting um, changes that happen. And because Isle Royale is a relatively small area, and there's not that uh, not that many wolves and not that many moose, um, these these what we would call demographic random events, stochastic events, and environmental events have huge impacts on on the um, on the population. So um, a a dog, a, they no longer allow dogs on the island, but the dog brought this virus and killed off a whole bunch of the wolves. Um, there was a big winter. Let's see, in something it looks like ninety six or ninety seven that really took down the moose population. And what happens is basically three wolves died in a mine in uh, looks like 2011 and pretty much made their um, population crash. And by 2018, there I believe there was only one or two wolves left on the island. Uh, but they've since brought in more wolves onto the island to help control the moose population. But so... You know, the wolves just dying is a demographic stochastic event. Now, three wolves dying wouldn't make a big impact to the wolf population of Yellowstone National Park, where there's a bunch of wolves there. But um, so when you have these very small populations in these small areas, you might get these extinction events like would have happened, or essentially what happened here with the wolves in, you know, looks like, about 60 years, but okay. So we've kind of got the why figured out, but they're in in the natural sense. But there's also this weird kind of um, sampling artifact that has to do with the species area relationship. So think about how much sampling you do and how many species you expect to find in your sample. Now, because it's a sample and not a census, that means you're not getting every single organism or every individual. You're not able to count every single thing that would be in your habitat. Okay? So what we find is that the more sampling you do, the more species you're eventually going to pick up. Now, whether this is in invertebrates in a stream, whether it's mammals in a forest, whether it's birds in a prairie, doesn't really matter what we're talking about. The more time you spend out sampling, looking, catching organisms, the more species you will eventually find. Um, so what happens then is you have some regional species pool. Now a regional species pool just means the total number of species that are generally found in that area. And the more sampling you get, eventually you pre uh, approach that regional species pool, count everything that can get there, and you're not going to find any more species. And what you see here, that what, what, what you get is a, what we call a species accumulation curve. Okay, so, oops, sorry. These are two different habitats where they went out and sampled um, bats. Okay, bats in two different types of forests. And um, they wanted to find, do these forests have different numbers of species? Okay. And what do we find here? Well, after some amount of sampling, what they get to is 18 species. Now, both forests have 18 different species. The first night, after one night, you know, they get so nine species here in the triangles. But they sit at nine species for a while until they start getting more and more species. But we then approach this species um, accumulation, or the, we approach the regional species pool, and you don't get any more species there. So it's what it is, is um, it's basically a cumulative record of species that only increases when new species is encountered. Okay, so look at these data right here. What we've got here is um, a, a sampling event where, let me turn on the annotation. 
Well, sure, we'll use red today. Okay. So the first sampling, um, let's say this is a transect walk where they're walking a trail looking for the number, looking for the species. So the first day you go out and you see two deer and three raccoons. Okay, great. So what that comes down to is you've done one sampling day and there's been two species. Okay, that's easy enough. Um, the second day, you go out and all you see are five deer and nothing else here. What that means then is you haven't increased in the number of species, right? You're still on the total number of time you've seen two species. The third day, so, so that sits right here at that um, two species. The third day, though, you come out and see two new species. So that's why after you increase to the third day, you get up there and increase two new species. Fourth day, though, we don't see any new species. The fifth day, then, we get the red squirrel finally, and we get one more species, so it goes up. Okay. Now, when we uh, make a species accumulation curve, in this case, we're using sampling days. Okay. Let's say you, in this case, you walk the same trail every single day to see what type of organisms you have in that area. Um, but it could be number of net sweeps, number of transects or quadrats that you put down, or the amount of time that you're out just, you know, watching a certain plot of land or something. Just, um, it's some measure of effort that you're going. So what you can ask then is you can use these species accumulation to curves to figure out when you have adequately sampled. And the answer to that is essentially, I really should turn off my Facebook notifications. Sorry about that. Okay, back here. So we're looking at um, this question, when have you adequately sampled? Okay. And the answer to that kind of basically just lies into um, when the curve flattens, okay? So when, as you're doing this study, you would go until this curve kind of like flattens out. Now you might still miss a rare species out there, um, but, you know, that's just kind of going to happen. So, you know... Looking in hindsight on this project, where they're looking at bats, and let's say, let's just look at the uh, black triangles here. They could have essentially been done at night eight. So, right, so night eight. Um, and they would have only missed two species. Okay. That's okay, but maybe, I don't, you know, I don't know how they're doing this sampling, probably some sort of mist net or something, but it saves you a whole lot of effort. Um, you, you can do basically a third of the effort here. Um, but the thing is, while you're doing this, you don't know when it flattens until you've done it for a while, right? You can't really think of it, about it if you in the moment, and you've only done eight nights of sampling. We, like your slope of the line at that time is going straight up. You don't know that you're actually in this inflection point where you're gonna flatten out here. So basically what you wanted to do is, once you see your curve starting to flatten out, it stays flat for a while, then you know you've basically researched, reached your regional species and then you can be done sampling. And you know that you've sampled the uh, adequate portion of the species diversity in your sample or in your region or your habitat. So the way though these species accumulation curves kind of react is really kind of funny. Um, so let's say you have a even community here. So let's call this community a. Okay. Uh, you've got community A and 
Cool. It's an even community, so you've got pretty much equal numbers of everything out there. What's going to happen is um, your species accumulation curve, as you sample more area, is going to follow this, you know, what we normally think of as this. You find most of the species right away, but then after a short amount of time, it pretty much flattens out and you find everything. Now think about this with this community B here, where you've got a really uneven community. So here you've got a lot of X's, okay? And um, not a lot of the other shapes. And let's say the, the key to this thing though is fine grained, okay? And now what that's referring to is the, if you're, let's say this is a, these are different plant species here. And fine grained means that like the area that you're sampling might only be something very small, okay? Like only that big. Um, so over and over again, even if you're doing randomness, it's going to be a while before you catch one of these rare species, okay? And rare species then can hide as long as your grain of your study, the amount of area that you're sampling, is relatively small. Those rare species can hide, and it takes longer for you to find them and longer for those um, this curve to eventually flatten out. Now, yes, this curve would eventually flatten out, um, it just um, takes takes a while. So imagine you're doing a sample where um, we want to figure out which forest has more bats. Okay, so let's say we had only in the circle forest we had only sampled four nights. But we sampled 15 nights for these bats in the black triangle forest. Okay, so does, they're just two different forests, doesn't really matter, right? So if you had sampled four nights in the, the white circle forest, you would have had 12 species, right? Somewhere, let's say, right there, right? If you had sampled in 15 nights, for 15 nights, you'd have. 17 species, way up here. So you, you can go back and figure out um, what should have, what, based on the species accumulation curve, you can find, figure out that um, this, you know, the white circle, only, you would have had your curve look like that, only the red here, right? So you know that, while well, the curve hasn't flattened out yet. But if it would have been with the, um, the black triangles, your curve would have looked something like this, and you would have known, well, we're pretty much flattened out, even though these curves kind of follow the same. We, you know, the truth is that both of these forests have 18 species of bats, but we didn't know that, okay? So you, what, what this, the red here is showing is that we should have sampled more because it hadn't flattened out yet. So there's another way to deal with um, unequal effort and size, though, which is something called uh, rarefaction. So let's um, take an example of these two lakes, Lake Mendota and Lake uh, Monona, right? So these are the two lakes in uh, Madison. And what do we got here? We've got way more, way more individuals, fish caught in Lake Mendota versus Lake Monona. So the question is, does Lake Mendota really have more species? Or did we just sample more in this lake? Okay. And the way we can figure this out is with something called rarefaction. It's what's called a bootstrapped calculation. Now, a bootstrap mean it, what that means is it's like an iterative process. Basically, you you make subsamples um, 
it, it's a simulated sampling over and over and over again. Um, and then you see what your data show. Um, and that it's, it's, it's like taking your data and doing this repeated process and seeing if, if your answer changes. So in reality, though, what, what happens, though, is what you would do is you would look at your two samples, okay? Lake Mendota has more, spe more species, yes, but we also had more individuals. You know, we sampled more than two and a half times. Looks like two and a half times, basically, uh, more fish in Lake Mendota. So what you could do is you could just, like, randomly shuffle up these, these species based on their abundances in Lake Mendota. So you could imagine a deck of cards where you had 56 bluegill cards, 63 yellow perch cards, 45 common shiner cards, and so forth, right? You shuffle those cards up, and then you take the top 71 cards, okay? And you find out how many species, how many types of cards you have in your that deck of 71 cards. Okay, and you might find that you have all six species, but you might find that you don't have all six species. So then you do that again, and you find you, you know, reshuffle your deck, pull out 71 cards, and see how many species there are. And what you would do then is make a 95% confidence interval and find out if um, like Mendota in, you know, so let's say you do it a hundred times, okay? You s shuffle your deck of cards up a hundred times and you find your 95% confidence interval, meaning you find the middle 95% uh, of your, um, of your, of your shuffles. And um, so you'd throw out two and a half. I know if you're doing 100, you would throw out the bottom two and a half. So this would be like the lowest species richness you have and then the highest species richness you have. So what you would see then is if the confidence interval includes the number of species in the smaller sample, the lakes you would expect to have equal richness. Okay, so I did this. Uh, and what I found was that, well, Pretty much um, almost all of them, actually every time I did it, um, I d so I did this a hundred times, I, that, that thing with, you know, shuffling that deck of cards, I didn't use actual deck of cards, uh, I used Excel, but um, I found every single time I did it, I got five species in Lake Men the, the Lake Mendota sample, these subsamples. What that means then is since every single time I did it, I got five species, I was essentially missing the carp probably, and maybe sometimes some of the walleye. But um, because I got five species, we know that Lake Mendota does have a higher species richness than Lake Mendota um, with, with equal sample. The thing is, this rarefaction thing is highly sensitive to uneven assemblages, okay? So this is a relatively uneven data set, right? Where these three species are super common and these species are much more rare, especially these carp here. Um, so rare species tend not to get picked up as much and that might have what happened with with this 95% confidence interval of always only having five species. Uh, had I done it realistically like 10,000 times, it might have been better and would have picked up these more rare events of getting that carp into some some of those times where I was, um, you know, shuffling the deck. But, um, but what this does is it allows you to essentially figure out without having to do a species accumulation curve. So it's kind of the example here where we have um, this circle, circle community versus the triangle community. In this case here, um, this is Lake Mendota, the 
triangle is like Mendota and the circle is like Mendota, which has you know fewer number of fish samples here. So it allows you to basically figure out whether rather than in the moment, it allows you to figure out whether you did enough sampling after you've done your sampling. Okay, so that's it for these um, lectures, and we'll have another lecture looking at another more patterns of diversity here really soon.